Just without further ado, just welcome Professor Lenny Ortenzi. Hey, you know, um, thank you so much for having me. This is just an honor. And uh, it's so funny, I, I, we started school two days ago, so I've been talking nonstop to uh, physics students for the last two days. So my throat is killing me because it's been a whole month since I had to talk out loud. So uh, I'm a little hoarse, so I apologize. But at the same time, it's so funny, I can talk to them without a problem. I'm nervous in front of you guys. Tell me why. I don't know. You look friendly. You look good looking. Preaching to the choirs. I, I've always talked in front of college students. They're three quarters uh, secular student alliance, and they have their laptops open at Wikipedia, and they're trying to check, catch me on all my errors. And uh, so this is weird. <laughs> You're not going to throw anything at me, and I don't expect you to tackle me. So I don't know what to talk about. You, know, so you probably agree with me. All right. So uh, uh, I thought we'd talk about the religion of evolution. I always had dreamed about having this book. I got the title of the book, and I have. I have the book written, but it's not actually written, it's all on audio. Uh, but I called it, the, the Emperor is Naked, Someone Should Say Something. And I don't know if you understand that reference, but The Emperor's New Clothes is a favorite book of mine. And, uh, and evolution is like the emperor, it's just absolutely taken over. And uh, we're getting conned, and you probably know this, <laughs> that you have to deal with uh, people that have that worldview, that paradigm, that is so strong in their mind, their eyesight is affected by it. And they'll blame you and say, it's your eyesight that's been screwed up, not theirs. And it's the you know battle of the worldviews. Did anybody come to that talk when the Veritas Exchange showed up and you actually heard me already? So two or three have already heard a lot of this that I'm not going to repeat myself. So talk to those people and I'll tell you all about worldviews. Or have me, uh, we'll meet at Applebee's. That's the best place, uh, Jeremy Pike. All right? Um, so I can figure out how to run this thing. Uh, so that's me, and uh, I love my favorite quote is uh, Homer Simpson. Uh, facts. <laughs> you can prove anything. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little about me. I was uh, raised as a short, bald Italian guy, and then later I experimented with hair, and then uh, <laughs> discovered girls and became an agnostic because, boy, did that Christianity get in the way of that. So, uh, But uh, yeah, I'm back to being a short, bald Italian guy. Um, and uh, I've always been a nerd, so I've always loved science. So science is one of my favorite things. So anything from winning science fairs when I was in seventh grade to uh, now I actually get paid an amazing amount of money <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to share physics, share science with uh, people. So I've, I've just been blessed with an amazing uh, life on being able to uh, get paid to be a nerd. <laughs> it's just the coolest thing ever. Um, I have some comics for you that I thought you'd enjoy. So let's just read with me here. Um, Uh, do you get that? Do you get that in your life where everybody, it's got to be true. If it, was, if it wasn't true, why would everybody believe it? It's like, yeah, well, there was a time where everybody thought the earth was flat, you know, and everybody thought the sun went around us. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Luckily, science doesn't run on majority rules, so uh, just because everybody's convinced evolution is true, except these crazy Jesus freaks, so it doesn't necessarily mean they're right. I love this one. <laughs> it evolved into a fact long, long ago. Here's another one I really like. Um, I have a colleague at Finger Lakes Community College, and I won't name her name. Jeremy knows that we've been praying for. Um, she finds out who the biology majors are that are Christian and switches it so she's their advisor, so she can bring her, bring them into her office and talk to them for three hours and how they have to get rid of this fairy tale because if they're ever going to make it in the scientific community, they have to get rid of this ridiculousness and actually embrace the fact of evolution and the fact of naturalism. Everything else is not scientific and uh, don't expect any, any support from her if you're going to keep this stupid idea. You know what that is? That's a witch evangelizing students into Wicca. Think about it. Naturalism. The nature is all there is. Nature has the power. Nature has creative power. You might as well capitalize you know, the whole thing. It, and she's getting away with evangelizing. I would get fired <laughs> when she gets to do it. So uh, it, it's, it's been tough. Here's another one I really love that uh, I find myself doing. 
you ever talk to somebody and hand them scripture? And like, okay, I'm listening. Here's another favorite one I like. It's like, all right, but let's start on neutral ground. Okay, let's leave the Bible out of it. Well, that's not neutral ground. You've already said you don't believe in the Bible. So moving over to there and say, okay, I'll debate you without using scripture. It's like, it's not neutral ground. It's, they already won because you've already acknowledged that that scripture isn't the ultimate truth that we can stand on. So it's a real interesting uh, uh, idea when you're out there. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you are uh, Christian and you love the Lord. And one of the reasons why I'm here is to encourage you to either get brave enough and bold enough to say something to someone other than the little comfortable crowd that you're already in that already believe what you believe, that will always reinforce your beliefs. And go out there and what the Lord said to do, and that is uh, be bold enough to preach and assume that the Holy Spirit is going to give you the words to say. And that is so scary. But for years I didn't do it, and then all of a sudden it just dawned on me. And I get these little times where I backslide and I don't say anything to anybody, and then it's like like God's got this great sense of humor and it sticks somebody in my class that does it. So first week of school I teach the scientific method, and you'd be surprised how most of my talk is... Uh, is all about how ridiculous evolution is. <laughs> There's nobody that refutes me. They've gotten mad. They've done YouTube videos and said, hortensia has gone too far. I'm going to get him fired. But when my boss comes up to me and says, what did you say? I go, well, good. I recorded it. You'd like to hear it. So uh, I'm not being misquoted. And, uh, There's nothing I'm saying that's not really good science. But my really good science refutes evolution a lot. And it really upsets people. Um, I don't know if this is going to work. We're looking for a way to play audio really loud. Can you hear this? Hold on. Um, is there a way to control the volume other than me? It is coming through. I heard it up there, but I didn't know how to make it loud. Ooh. Oh, that's funny. That's me? Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> You know what? <laughs> I stole it from Answers in Genesis. It's really a cool thing. And it's just this quick little video on uh, refuting evolution. And it's really kind of neat. So um, if we get it to work later, I'll show it during Q&A. But right now, I don't want to take time away from that. So let's go to the next one. I love this one. After that video, I was going to show you that it pretty much, pretty much slam dunks evolution uh, as a worldview. And how the, the error really is saying that that's good science. They do a bait and switch on you. They use the word evolution. Uh, and they say, well, evolution's a fact. Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang says it's a fact, so it's got to be a fact. So the Big Bang <laughs> is a fact, and evolution is a fact. And they say these words like they're a fact. But what they're really saying is this one definition of evolution's a fact. And that is change over time. Yeah, we already know that's true. And uh, natural selection. We know that's true. And we know that mutations happen. Change in, a, in an organism. Change. You know, like you get whole different color birds, and it's really, really fun. It's all really cool. But... Then they switch it up from amoeba to man, from goo to you, via the zoo. That's a made-up philosophy that's now testable or provable in real science. So you probably already know this, but I'm going to remind you, and remind you that, he, that they have a worldview that's not a testable worldview, and therefore it's not science. So don't anybody con you. And if you're ever talking to somebody and you end up getting into some kind of discussion with them, all you got to do is remind them that they are a religious person. It drives them nuts. It's a religion of naturalism, but that's just a philosophy. There's no testability there. It's not objectionable science that we learn about in science class. I can't put it in a lab and test for falsification. It's not falsifiable, so therefore, it's not science. It's a religion. So it's like a religion <coughs> of evolution. It's just, it's a state-sanctioned, tax-supported religion, and therefore, 
they really get the word out, man. They got evangelists everywhere. And you're this little crowd of people that I happen to believe hold the truth. So how do you fight that? Well, that's what I mean. The truth always seems to win, which is really cool. Because if you look at the statistics in America, in spite of it being a state-sanctioned, tax-supported religion, if you pull the average American, they secretly know evolution is, is a lie. They'll always come up with an escape clause. They'll always come up with a, a belief-saving device. I call it a BS device. And, and they'll always come up with a way of saving their belief system, but it's not good science. And so you should be aware of that in your mind. I, and I'm sharing it with you guys because I want you to take comfort in the fact that, uh, well, here, I'll word it for you, just as plain as day. If you asked the average college student and asked yourself and a Christian community, which worldview has more scientific evidence to support it? Evolution or a creation model? A design kind of model? A biblical worldview? Or an evolutionary worldview? If you ask the average college student which one has more scientific evidence that supports it, what do you think they'd say? Evolutionary. Okay, now, be really, really honest with yourself. You don't have to say this out loud because you're so quiet and scary. All right? <laughs> but what do you think? The average Christian, who's a professing Christian, would say, if you said, which worldview has more scientific evidence that supports it? This is the scary thing. 80% of the Christians you ask will say the evolutionary. They've been so indoctrinated, they don't even know they bought into it. They have compromised. Uh, they either don't know the Word of God or they've been, been conned by pseudoscience into thinking. Folks, you got the right answer. And science supports you. All right? But let me, with that statement, point something out that's real clear. The facts are the facts. The evidence is the evidence. And like I said last time I talked here, it's your worldview that decides how you interpret the evidence. So in truth, the answer to the question, which worldview is most supported by the scientific evidence? The answer is neither. Scientific evidence is scientific evidence, and then we interpret it through our worldview. So who's right? I don't know. But it's not a question of science versus religion. It's religion versus religion. And be aware of that, that you may not be able to prove you're right, but you certainly don't have to look back and say that the evidence supports them. It doesn't support them. If you really look at the models, uh, a good scientist would pick the model that follows the evidence better. And I happen to believe the actual observable evidence follows my worldview better than it follows a naturalistic worldview. And I'm saying that as a physicist, not as a Christian. <coughs> I'm following the evidence and look where it got me. The Jesus <laughs> This is really cool, but that's how it is. Okay? All right, one more joke. Ready? Come on, man. I love Star Trek. You there. How old is that? Six years, three months, and six days. Like my wife. Well, <laughs> double call. All right. Isn't that beautiful? You know, that's about as logical to say yes sometimes. I love it. So here you are at a college campus, and you hear this girl say, I was excited that my new friends at college were open as I shared that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. She's all thrilled because people just, just said, oh, yeah, well, you might be right. And then say, yeah, just as receptive when Amy stated she believed that God was found in everything. And everyone seemed to be just as enthused when Tammy stated she didn't believe God existed and everyone gets to go to heaven. And then there was that total agreement when Sarah stated that it really didn't matter what you believe as long as you had strong convictions. But what really astonished me is when my friend stated that we were all really saying the same. So what's the whole point? Here's a quote by Alan Bloom. It's amazing. There's one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering college believes, or says they believe, that truth is relative. That they have no absolute standard of what's right and what's wrong. It's whatever you believe in your heart. You know, as the Mormons would tell you, it's that burning in their bosom that will just testify to you that what Joseph Smith said was true. And if that's what you do, then it's whatever you feel. 
know, it's like the, I don't know, the emperor saying to Anakin, trust your feelings, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's not the way it should work. So you know this to be true, but I got to remind you, 70 percent of uh, church youth walk away from their faith within the first year in uh, U of R. <laughs> okay, so um, sorry. Uh, so America, aren't we proud? We got the largest number of churches and seminaries and Christian colleges, Christian bookshops and resources and Christian radios. Aren't we proud of ourselves? We got so much Christianity going around, and yet. Every single day, and you know this is true, this whole generation that's coming up right now is absolutely, totally getting less Christian every day. Every day, relative truth is winning, and, and uh, they're thinking I'm a moron for being a physicist and a Christian at the same time. They can't figure out how I even do it. And I just got to quote some here. Uh, I've told you earthly things and you don't believe me. How are you going to believe me when I tell you about heavenly things? If you didn't believe Moses and the prophets, neither you'd be persuaded, even if somebody raises from the dead. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So what is the foundation that's been destroyed? I happen to believe it's a literal Genesis. I know that for some people that makes them really uncomfortable because they can't read Genesis and not have the world's doctrines screaming in their ear, yeah, but Adam and Eve might not have been totally literal. Well, then Jesus was just goofed up, man. Jesus thought Adam and Eve were literal. I guess he didn't know all the science that we know. Right? And Jesus has been misinformed. Remind me to have you guys explain that to him. You know, it's like it, it's 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 that solid faith in the Scripture being really inspired by God that gets you to a place where if Genesis is true, then maybe we can look at science through the eyes of Scripture rather than tearing out Scripture through the eyes of science or pseudoscience, naturally. All right. So all these kids are going in droves into the museums, and they learn from an early age, like little sheep, sheeple. They go in there, and what do they learn? They learn this evolutionary model, and they learn the Big Bang, 20 billion years. Now it's 13 billion years. When I was a kid, it's 16 billion years. It sounds like they don't know for sure or something. And then uh, Earth formed about four and a half to five billion years ago. Chemicals somehow came alive, even though it violates no laws of physics and chemistry. Three billion years ago, and the light diverged about one billion years ago, and that pre-Cambrian explosion that can't be explained, everything just happened all by itself. Nature did it. Chance did it. Chance should have a capital C. All right? And then mankind somehow appeared a million years ago after branching off from the great apes, and we're all just nothing but a bunch of primates. And that's the evolutionary motto. And you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it, and you fight it every day, and part of your brain right now is saying, it hurts for me to be so different than all these people out there, because they all just believe it, and I feel like such an outcast not accepting it as truth. It's really, really hard. I remember how difficult it was to have to go against all that peer pressure, and it's, whether you want to admit it, it's pressure. It really is. Okay? So that worldview is millions of years, death, suffering, bloodshed, and disease, and out of all that, man's existence. All right? Now, there's another worldview, <laughs> a biblical worldview, that says that the entire universe, fairly formed and functional, showed up about 6,000 years ago. I happen to believe that some seriously cool <laughs> physicists are now working on a model that's based on a biblical principle. I wonder why God had to mention 17 different times by four different authors over a span of 1,000 years that God stretched forth the heavens. So anybody majoring in physics in here, who knows if you can get your doctorate degree sometimes showing that the actual space time fabric stretched. And when it stretched, you can actually explain with the general theory of relativity how this universe could actually be, according to my clock, 6,000 years old. But according to some clocks on the edge, 16 billion. And we're not contradicting each other. Time is relative if you just assume one thing that there was a center and an edge. All the evidence shows that the Milky Way is in the center and there's an edge. Stephen Hawking says we can't be in the center. That would make us special. And I'm in a wheelchair and I'm this, so we're not, stuck. We're, we're not in the center. Now, he's not saying we're not in the center because of the observable evidence. 
He's saying we're not in the center because we can't be in the center because if we're in the center, we'll be special. And we're not special. You hear that? This is the world's greatest physicist saying his faith, his ideology, his worldview doesn't permit him to see the evidence. The evidence is Milky Way is in the center and there's an edge. If there is a center and there is an edge, then the clocks run differently on the edge as they do in the center. And we all came out of a big black hole. You can ask about that in the Q of A. <laughs> and, uh, and time is relative. And there could be galaxies out there that are 16 billion years old according to their clocks, but the last thing to emerge out of this black hole, the clock might have started 6,000 years ago. And there's no contradiction. And Adam would have saw the entire universe on day six as if it was just out of nothing, everything. Just like the opening scene of the first Narnia book, where it was the magician's nephew, where he just sang a note, and all the stars showed up. From Adam's point of view, that might have been what he saw. It'd be really cool. Okay? Sudden appearance of every basic form of life. A designer. I held a pig's trachea in my hand the other day, because I was helping a bunch of biologists do a science show for a bunch of fifth graders. And I held a trachea and a lung in my hand. And I saw the rings of cartilage to protect it from ever collapsing. And the esophagus was like this sausage link without the sausage in it. It was just flopping around. Why? It has to stretch because I eat too much. And the food's too big. It stretches. And it uses peristalsis to go down. But that trachea was rock solid. I could hit it. And that trachea broke up into the bronchial tubes. And all this cartilage, all perfectly designed. You wish you could find an engineer and make something close to a lung. You wish. But if you did, he'd be walking around saying he's the best engineer on the planet because he just made something that functions to change just regular oxygen and transfer it into these moving little particles that go through a circulatory system that gets the food and the fuel to these little entities over here. If you could ever have an engineer make something like that, they would be world famous. And yet, here it is in a pig, laying on a table for fifth graders. And my two biologists tell me, isn't it amazing how this evolved out of an amoeba? Yeah. It's an engineer, man. I'm, I'm a physicist. That's an engineer that kicks major butt on engineering. There is no engineer on this planet that can come close to a fly's eardrum. And I know this because Binghamton now has five patents on a hearing aid that's directional. So I'll, if you have this hearing aid in, it's not everything being amplified. It's just the person you're talking to. And all this gets ignored. They're all geniuses. They're going to make millions and millions of dollars inventing this ear hearing aid microphone that's made. You know where they stole the idea from? A fly's eardrum. Don't give credit to the original design. Just give credit to the ones who stole the idea. I love it. All right. So. I actually believe that a mountain cover and flood, global in extent, destroyed and buried almost all of life, except for like eight people and a whole bunch of animals, approximately about 5,000 years ago. And I think there's some real solid science that supports this hypothesis. And that's what my book is about. I'm just going to go through the Adam and Eve hypothesis, the flood hypothesis, and analyze the data and see which worldview follows the evidence more. And, uh, uh, this is what people start thinking every time I slow this picture. I don't know why. I just think this is the funniest thing ever. Oh, there you go. Jesus and Darwin are at it again. But you know what? It really isn't some kind of science versus religion thing. It's really two worldviews. So I like this picture. See, you got a skull, and you got two people looking at the exact same, exact same evidence. And look what they're saying. Great evidence for creation. Great evidence for evolution. You see, the same input different output because there's two different operating systems, okay? I happen to believe a born-again Christian actually rewrote the operating system, just wiped the whole hard drive off and put on a new operating system. Wouldn't that be great if it was really true? Here's what's really happening is, I'm a stubborn nutcase and I kept my old operating system that every once in a while I use instead of the new one. Oh, if only I could just completely be willing to wipe off the old hard drive and start with the new operating system that is an amazing upgrade from what I've been living with. Um, you see how it's not the evidence? It's not the evidence. I'm telling you, I showed my students 
blood vessels in a T-Rex that supposedly got buried and died 68 million years ago. And that worldview is so embedded in their brain that when I showed them blood vessels and tissue that they dug out of the femur bone of this T-Rex, and I said, all the evidence showed that tissue cannot stay viable for more than three, 4,000 years. And yet, you're looking at tissue from a T-Rex. What do you say? You know what they said? We were wrong. Tissue can last 65 million years. It's not the evidence. It's your belief system. Who's right? Well, from a scientific point of view, I've got to say, I don't know. I can't test either. It happened in the past, and I can't rebury a T-Rex that's walking around saying how long the tissue will last for. I can't test it. It's faith. But there's just faith, too. Just follow which one makes more sense from the evidence. So, secular history stares at what they're looking at through the eyesight of man's theories. See how this picture really explains what the problem really is? He sees millions of years because he sees life and death and struggle and pain and disease. So because he believes in millions of years, he looks through those glasses and he sees all this death. You can see there's no God. See, evolution's true. Doesn't that make sense that he would do that? If he looks through those lenses, of course he's going to see that. But there's the biblical glasses. He sees the same evidence, the same death, the same horrible stuff. And you know what they say? Man, a beautiful, perfect creation that God said, very good. And we screwed it up. And out of that screw up came from creation to corruption. And from corruption, we had a worldwide flood that wiped everybody out except eight people and a whole bunch of really cool animals. Okay? And out of that came confusion, like the Tower of Babylon. And people spread all over and became races. We only got one race here, people. It's called the human race. When people tell you that the Asians evolved separately than the Africans, and this evolved, like, oh, bull, it's not, it's not it. We have one race. How do I know? Y'all can breed with anybody you want, and you get kids. We're all the same species. Come on, man, you look at bio class. Dogs breed dogs and get dogs. Pigs breed with pigs and get Pigs, they're the same kind, follows the biblical model exactly. They, they multiply it to their own kind. So if you look through those lenses, then you see the seven seas of history, see confusion, and then you see Christ and the cross, and then finally you're going to get to a place where it's going to clean up the whole thing, and it's going to be back. And I'll have to be a vegetarian, so I'm eating as much meat as I possibly can before it gets back here. Applebee's. All right, so... So what's the Bible say about the age of the earth? Why am I focusing on the age of the earth? Oh, well, because that's what Genesis said. And I used to be able to compromise and say, well, maybe the earth is really, really old. Jesus got it wrong. Um, maybe the earth is really, really old, and then Adam and Eve showed up like 6,000 years ago. Hugh Ross believed and stuff. Old earth, but young, new creation. You know, it's just like, it's a compromise, okay? It's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Hebrew meant. Any scholar that even believes in an old earth will tell you that's not what the narrative says. That's not what the Hebrew is saying. So what am I going to do with that information? What am I going to do with the information that the guy I think is the son of the Most High God that was here to speak creation into existence, who actually was here, says, in the beginning, he's talking about divorce. That's not how God meant it, in the beginning. He meant man and female, leave mom, leave dad, and the two become as one. He's talking about Adam and Eve, man. That's the beginning. So what are we going to do with this? Jesus is misinformed? Or Jesus is a little smarter than my average biology teacher who can't even keep his textbook the same after 50 years? But scripture seems to be okay and still relevant. And that was written over a span of 1,800 years with 40 different people writing 66 different books. And it all seems to be one author. <coughs> Which one am I going to put my trust in? Which one am I going to believe in? Okay? So there you go. Very good. So, God saw everything that was good, and it was good. And then, here's where you stretch it. This is where you say the gap theory. Just chop it in half and go. There's a billion, billion years in between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2. Or stretch it out and say, well, he didn't really mean a day, meaning a day. He meant a million years. Really? He meant a million years? He made the plants on day three. You've got to wait a, wait a million years for the sun to start shining. That's tough for photosynthesis. But if you made the plants on day three and you only have to wait 24 hours, 
the sun comes out. Oh, see, that might make some people comfortable who uncomfortable if you were kind of wanting to sort of agree with these secular people so you don't feel so much like an outcast, but in our reality, Genesis taught you this is the way it is. And it's tough, and it took me 20 years to, to admit it. Okay? Uh, theistic evolution, that's my favorite, where uh, God did it. God used evolution. Really? If God used evolution, I probably would have thought he would say that in the book. But in the book, he made sure it was very clear he didn't. So why don't I just trust what he said? Yeah, because I've been indoctrinated, and I've been crushed. Okay? So what does the Bible say? Well, even if some shepherd says, I don't believe the earth was created in six literal days. Yeah? Well, how do you know? Were you there? And there's that little cute baby saying, well, yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so if Jesus thought that was true, I'm going with that one. All right? Um, the Bible says the age of the earth is some bizarre stuff. It's really clear by the wording in Hebrews, uh, in, in the Hebrew under Genesis, that very, very specifically, it told you how old Adam was when <laughs> Seth was born. So if you think Adam was Seth's grandfather, it doesn't even matter. It's still when Adam was 130 years old, Seth showed up. They, he made it so clear you couldn't question it. You couldn't compromise. You couldn't change your mind. Okay? So you go right down there and you look at the age, the death, and what year it was from Adam's birthday when Jacob showed up at 2255 after Adam. Now there may be some question about these guys in here, but there's not that much question. Even if I give you a thousand years different, there's no way I'm going to be able to agree with the naturalist and the old earthers. Okay? And you might be surprised that I came here and talked about the old earth. It's controversial. There might be people in here that are pretty comfortable with it. It's not like you're not saved or you don't believe in a young earth like me. All right? But I am sharing with you as a physicist and as a scientist, and I'm as objective as I possibly can, in spite of the fact that I believe in God. I really, after 20 years, have come to the conclusion that I'm going to have to trust Scripture on this one. And then I'm starting to look at the evidence. But, well, if Scripture is accurate and is God-inspired, and I don't think I'm misinterpreting it. Sometimes I do, and that's what gets me in trouble. You know, Remember like the church thought Scripture said that the earth was in the center, so the sun couldn't be in the center, and the earth couldn't go around the sun? It's not in Scripture, but they interpreted certain things to be that way. So am I misinterpreting scripture and thinking the earth is young? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I looked at it and looked at it for 20 years. I fought it like <laughs> went dragging and screaming down a young earth kind of thing. Because I was so happy sort of fitting in to the world view of my friends. Yeah, I really is uh, a young earth after all. It's a young earth. All right, so, um, <laughs> so the age of the earth is a bigger deal than you think because it's the foundation. What they'll do is they'll chip away at your foundation. Well, is Jesus the Son of God? Yeah, how do you know? Well, the Scripture says so. Really? The same Scripture said that Adam and Eve existed. You don't really believe Adam and Eve really existed, do you? <coughs> says your friends. Well, what if you say, well, maybe it's not literal. Well, Genesis isn't literal, but Matthew is. But the genealogy in Luke goes back to Adam. So when did it start becoming folklore? Abraham existed, but Abraham's dad didn't. See where your problem is? See where you compromise and you might not know if you're doing it or not? This might make some of you uncomfortable and other people are like, yeah, I'm right after you. Okay? Listen to this. This is from a guy who doesn't believe in God or anything, but he's a, he, a Hebrew uh, scholar. Apparent that the most straightforward and understanding of the Genesis record, without regard to all the medical considerations suggested by science, is that God created heaven and earth in six solar days. He goes on, there's dot, dot, dot. He goes on and says, yeah, but we know from science that it wasn't. Therefore, Genesis is wrong and the narrator wasn't inspired by God. See how his worldview? answered the question. I don't believe that the earth could have been created 6,000 years ago, so therefore he's wrong. And therefore, Genesis is wrong. Because I don't believe it could have happened. Well, there you go. Your religious views just trump the Bible. Relative truth 
and there's the real problem. It's got nothing to do with the evidence. We could talk about evidence forever. Here's something that will shock you. The vast majority of dating methods, if you want to date the Earth, if you want to use the same science they're using, the vast majority of dating methods indicate, ready for this, younger. What? No. Yeah. I win. And we're going to keep score. I, I'm, kicking their, their, I'm kicking their butt. I win. Okay? So, old age dating methods and then the younger dating methods are beaten out. For every dating method indicating those years, there are ten methods indicating the Earth is far too young for evolution to ever have happened. I don't think evolution could happen anyway from physics and uh, genetics point of view, but even if you give me like 16 billion years, it's not going to happen. But it really, really is not going to happen in 6,000 years, is it? But T-Rex has blood inside. I want you to go away thinking about that. I listed just a few that I could think of, <laughs> of uh, indicators that show you a young Earth that you'll never hear about in astronomy class or a science class at U of R. Sorry. You're going to get your own education. You're going to have to go on and uh, do your own research. Or maybe some of you will write your doctorate thesis on that. Be so cool. Good luck in getting published, but <laughs> I'll pray for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a whole lot of indicators. You want to ask me about a few of these? Some of them I really know well, and other ones I'm just scratching the surface on. And uh, we're arguing about tree rings and, <laughs> and things like that. So uh, uh, I just wanted to share with you something before I stop. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. The evidence is strongly in my favor as a young earth, born again, <coughs> Bible believing, Jesus free. <laughs> Scientifically, it's in my favor. But you will always have somebody with a belief saving device that will say it. I'll give you a great example. Uh, one you've got to bring up in QA the Oort Cloud. It's a, it's a belief-saving device. If you believe the Earth and the solar system is 10,000 years old or less because the Bible says so, then what would you expect? You'd expect to see comets. If you believe the Earth is millions and billions of years old and the solar system came into uh, its existence through natural processes four and a half billion years old, Comets shouldn't be out there anymore because comets burn out every time they go around the sun. We've got video of them hitting the sun. We've got video of them hitting Jupiter. They don't last long. They're dirty snowballs, and every time we have a meteor shower, we get reminded that they leave a little bit of themselves behind, and we drive through their path with our Earth. They get smaller every time they go around the sun, so there's no such thing as comets that last more than 10,000 years. But wait a minute, we have comets. So wouldn't that date the solar system at less than 10,000 years? Well, every one of my friend nods. Yeah, good evidence for a young Earth. You know what they say with their belief-saving device, BS device? Ready? Well, four, 40 times farther away than Pluto is, there's an Oort cloud named after Hans Oort who thought this one up. Then that Oort cloud is filled with a nursery of comets that every once in a while collide with each other and keep feeding our solar system with brand new ones. Really? Is there any observable evidence for the Oort cloud? Oh no, too far away. Well, how do you know it exists? Well, it's got to be. Why? Well, because the universe is four and a half billion years old, we still have comets. And they, that's okay with them. So there's books written on the Oort cloud. It's density, it's composition, what it's made out of, how long it's been around, what's its diameter, where is it? Books are written on the Oort Club. Books are going to be written on dark energy, dark matter. They're belief-saving devices, BS devices that stop the people from giving up the Big Bang hypothesis that is falling apart in front of their very eyes because the observable evidence is getting thrown out based on what we see, you couldn't have had a hot Big Bang without making stuff up like dark energy and dark matter and violations of known physics laws. But they're going to keep it, and 
and sing songs on TV about it. So, the point I'm trying to make here is, I could overwhelm people with it. If you want to ask me questions about this during your Q&A, that's awesome. But, it doesn't matter. Everybody's always going to have a belief-saving device. You know what the real question you got to get to is? What's your authority? Do you have justifiable reasons for embracing a naturalistic worldview? That's the core. You don't believe a biblical worldview, you believe a naturalistic worldview. Everything made itself. Do you have any evidence to justify that belief system? While you're holding a trachea of a bit, or when you're looking at the iris of a flower, or when you're watching a little baby being born, do you have any justification for a naturalistic worldview? You find out how complicated an amoeba is. Can you justify a naturalistic worldview? When you look at the beauty of the awesome nature, in spite of it being screwed up by us and our sin, and a whole universe groaning, waiting to get fixed again, in spite of all the corruption, it's still beautiful. You still can see beauty everywhere. Can you justify that with a naturalistic worldview? No, I don't think so. But they are. They're trying. And therefore, they're getting to a point in their life where they have to borrow our worldview, the Christian worldview, to use logic, to use arguments, to use the belief that your memory is valid. That's all based on a God that would create order and, and have everything follow some kind of rules of nature, rules of logic. They're borrowing our worldview to argue against our worldview. Isn't that funny? Because they can't use their own. From a naturalistic worldview, they can't justify their own thoughts. How can, from a naturalistic worldview, if you're just rearranged pond scum, how can you justify that you have the same physics rules of gravity today as you did yesterday? How do you justify that in a chaos world? How do you believe your own thoughts? How do you know you're even making sense? How do you know you thought this yesterday? It's all based on a Christian worldview in order to even argue against the Christian worldview. And you, if you start recognizing this in people that you're bold enough to talk to about it, you'll get past the evidence, you'll get past all that stuff, and you'll just find out. Tear down their naturalistic worldview. Ask them some really good questions on if you're rearranged pond scum, how do you justify morality? It's not good evolution. Hitler was good evolution. Morality is not good evolution. How do you justify it? Have some fun with them. <laughs> Bring them to one of these talks, man. Veritas Exchange, man. Have it go like that. But uh, that's all I wanted to tell you. I really appreciate you having me come and do it. And uh, wake up, man. you got to ask me a question now. You snooze for half of it. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not the kind of guy that would embarrass a kid in the front seat. So I <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> All right, so I'm done. So, uh, it, you have anything you were wondering about? Do you want to talk about any evidence? <laughs> Nothing? Come on. Yes, ma'am, talk to me. Join the dark side and then come back? <laughs> um, man. Well, Jeremy said I was the honest person, so I'll tell you the honest truth. Um, raised Catholic could make an atheist out of almost anybody when the Catholicism, uh, and I don't mean to pick on Catholics, I'm you know, probably still considered a Catholic from my mom's point of view, and uh, uh, somebody, some Baptist lady came up to my mom one time at a charismatic or some conference and said, what church do you go to, honey? And she said, uh, uh, Mount Carmel, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Catholic Church, and, and the, the lady said, what? You're in a Catholic church? Why? And my mom, just without even thinking, said, because my pastor's not saved yet. My priest isn't saved yet. Is that cool? It's like, instead of running away from it, you know, maybe God wants you to be where you are. So, I had some arguments with my mom about Catholicism because it seemed to me Jesus died for my sins and we're living in grace. And she told me to read the Bible, so I did, right? And Songs of Solomon was a 
first thing you read as a teenager, by the way. And then, uh, <laughs> whoa, man. <laughs> like twin sheep. I mean, we're talking eroticism. But uh, when I... Uh, when I started reading the Bible and I started seeing Catholicism having some rules that contradicted Jesus' teachings, I couldn't understand how a Catholic could uh, say they're Christian when they're not following Christ. So it started making me question it, and then I was starting to get the peer pressure from my friends and from my teachers in college that were pretty much saying, come on, you're not going to really believe that. It's like Santa Claus. You know, we grew out of Santa Claus, and the way I perceived of God was like Santa Claus. You know, you better watch out. You better not cry. And I'll tell you why. You know, because he knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So you better be good for goodness sake. I mean, so I had a God that was Santa, and when Santa went away, I thought, well, then God must be just one more joke my parents were telling on me. I'm waiting for, you know, Easter Bunny, Santa, God. And so you're a teenager, man. You're supposed to rebel, right? So I rebelled in that area. So I was an agnostic. But Jeremy wants me to tell you the absolute truth. And the absolute truth is I'm a guy, and I like women. And it really did cramp my style to have God. It really did. So it was very convenient not to have God in my life when there was women at college. <laughs> You know? Now, other people turn away from the faith just because their professor made them feel stupid for being a Christian. But with me, I was very bold and very argumentative, and I could argue the Christian worldview, I could argue an evolutionary worldview, and I'd win every time. I was Mr. Debater. You know, I, I would win any argument, depending on what side you wanted me to be on that day. So I loved to argue. But when it came right down to the truth, the reason why God wasn't part of my life was because he cramped my style. And through a series of really cool events that I couldn't possibly go into now, so we'll have to all meet at the Apple Beast to share that one. But through a series of events, the God of the universe revealed himself to me, and I had no idea he was going to take me up on my threat. I was, remember standing at the falls uh, on a cliff and just kneeling down and saying, if you do exist, you made me like this. I'm more doubting Thomas than I am anybody else. Look, you got to give me some meat here. you got to give me some facts. you got to give me some science. You can't say, ignore all the scientists and just <coughs> blindly believe in me. I can't do it. If you made me, you wired me this way. You can't sit back and just say, just believe and ignore all the evidence and ignore all the science. You can't do that to me, God. If you exist, you got to get me some. And he took me up on that off. And I, I got knocked down and humbled by how amazingly obvious it is that he exists and he made everything. And the design is everywhere. And you honestly got to be a fool to say in your heart, there's no God. You gotta shut off your brain to say there's no God. You, you have to. And I got to that place through 14 different occurrences that happened in three months that were just unbelievable. Where there was no way I could deny after the 14th coincidence that there was any such thing as coincidence. It was a loving God smacking me on the side of the head, giving me the old V8 thing. So that's where I came back. Okay. It's been a struggle. <laughs> I've fought it tooth and nail. You know, I like being a theist evolution. That was cool. And, and I like being a uh, old earther. At least I had some credibility with my friends. But now I'm a young earth, annoying, crazy guy. They all think I left my brain at the corner until they start asking me questions. And then they find out that, oh my goodness, <laughs> they can't seem to win an argument against me with the young earth older debate. If you want to, you have some fun. If you're an old earther, let's have some fun. <laughs> Do it. Go ahead. Ask me about dino blood. Go ahead. I dare you to. <laughs> Come on. <coughs> something else. Anything? You want some old earth stuff here? <laughs> here, pick one of these. Uh, nope. Is that the wrong way? Yeah. What do you think? Anything out there? Question? Oh, those were 
ones that I've been I've been doing a, a couple more stuff on, and so I have PowerPoints uh, here and there that have to do with those. Like I I cherry picked a few of those and made PowerPoints out of those for people who want me to come to the small groups or. Um, stuff. Yes. Can you um, explain how the rotation uh, speed of the Earth shows that? Oh, yeah. Um, the Earth is slowing down because of the tides. So if you play the game backwards, the moon is leaving us at about an inch a year. Bye bye, moon. You know? So an inch a year. So if you want to play the tape back a little bit, it would have been touching us using the inverse square law of gravitational attraction and stuff like that. It would have actually touched us 1.2 billion years ago. And it would have caused so many amazing tidal effects if it was too close that nothing, the Earth would have been ripped apart if the moon was close enough. So it kind of shows that there's a, the, the moon-Earth system could not be um, <coughs> older than about, I think it's about 800,000 years. And the rotation of the Earth, with the moon being like that, would have slowed down tremendously, which means the Earth would have been spinning like absolutely mad fast in the beginning to almost get ripped apart for it to justify that it's taking as long as it's taking now for that time period. So it goes with the other thing about the moon would have sm smacked into us if you played the tape back. We're losing it an inch a year. You just go backwards and say, well, where was it so close that it would have caused it? And then you say, well, that would have stopped the Earth from spinning. We would have been in, in a gravity lock. And, and if it was still molted underneath, it would have pulled our core over to the side, just like the moon is in gravity lock. You know about the moon? The moon goes around the Earth in 29 days about, but it goes around its own axis in the same amount of time. That's why you only get to see the same side. It's spinning as fast as it's revolving. Is that a coincidence? Oh, heck no. It's because when it was still <coughs> liquidy, the core might have solidified you ever notice the side close to us has a whole bunch of lava things called seas, but the other side is pure craters? So it's off-centered on its weight. It did a little number, right? So uh, where the moon came from, uh, every one of their hypotheses has been shown to be incorrect. We don't know where it, it sure looks like from the material we gathered from there that the moon and the earth were appeared at the same time independent of one another, as if Somebody just created it. <laughs> it didn't come out of the Pacific Ocean, like they're saying. The new one is a meteor hit one side of the Earth and popped the moon out the other side. No. And they still, they'll write it in the textbooks as if they had a video camera going. They're that sure. But they get grant money if they sound sure. So You've got to be careful when a scientist tells you something that can't be tested and can't be observed, but it happened. You gotta be careful when they say that. Really? It's a fact? Yes, it's a fact. No, it's not. It's a belief system. It's, if it's not testable, they can say anything they want. So I do. I have some fun. I tell people that's everything they want. You know how the dinosaurs went extinct? Well, it was desert conditions, so the dinosaurs started digging holes in the ground to look for water. And unfortunately, they all fell in, and then they all got buried. That's, <laughs> that's as stupid as theirs. Is it any less scientific than theirs? No, they're on even ground, man. I can say anything I want. Can't test it, can't observe it, and it happened in the past. Say whatever you want. According to Gary Larson on the far side, they all were smoking marijuana too much. That's how they went all extinct. Remember that cartoon? <laughs> yes, sir? I just had a question about the size of the Earth's human population. Oh, yeah. And where that fits in. Well, if you start with what we got now, <laughs> Um, and you assume a 50-year generation year, which is not too bad. Um, uh, in a million years, you should have 25, 30 billion people. Where are all the bodies? That's one million years since humans showed up. If you play that same scenario, how many people we got now? same growth rate and back it up 
you end up with two people 4,500 years ago. <laughs> yes? Um, two questions. Um, could you explain the uh, decay of the Earth's magnetic field? And then after you explain that, could you explain like um, uh, the race that you're talking about, whether they're considered constant and why they're considered constant? Because it seems like the race I, that you're talking about. Like, right, I play the same game they play. They tell you how old the Earth is based on a, a belief system known as uniformitarianism. And that is that the present is a key to the past, that the rate of deposit now is the same as the rate of deposit. So how long did it take the Grand Canyon to form? Well, they know how long it would take a dust to form this much of a layer. So they figure it's 100 years to make this much layer. How much does it take to make a mile deep? And now they know how old the Grand Canyon is. That's a flawed logic, right? So for fun, I use the same flawed logic. And I say, OK, well, I'll use your rules. If you use your rules, if the magnetic field is decaying at this rate now, even though I believe it's decaying rapidly, I think the decay rate is increasing. In time. I personally think there's data that's showing that it's decreasing more rapidly now, right? In other words, it's not only decaying, but it's accelerating its decay. Are you with me on this one? It's not just decaying linearly, it's decaying exponentially. Okay? So play the tape back. If that same graph that you're seeing now on how it's decaying, if it's decaying at that same function backwards, that 30,000 years ago, we would have the magnetic field of a neutron star. Okay? So I play their same game. If you see the decay rate right now, work your way backwards, what was the magnetic field in the Earth 30,000 years ago? Nothing could survive. There could be no life on this planet 30,000 years ago because of the strength of the magnetic field being too high. So I play their game with that, all right? Then they'll hit me with this one. Yeah, but, and then they'll say the following thing as a fact. Yeah, but the Earth's magnetic field has reversed in the past over and over again. And we just happen to be in a decay part, but it's going to go back up and turn into a South Pole and a North Pole soon. And I say, really, show me the evidence. So then they show me the evidence. Well, you see, there's magnetic field lines pointing at the bottom of the ocean one way. And then the magnetic fields are pointing in the next layer the other way. See the assumption? They think there's millions of years between layers. So then they make it assume it's that. But now we have found, thanks to Mount St. Helens, that layers that have shown up in one week, layers that look like the Grand Canyon, and I have a PowerPoint that fools all my students and it makes them go crazy because I show pictures of the Grand Canyon, how long did it take to form? How long did it take to form? How long did it take to form? I, Jeremy knows, we were at RIT, some kid yelled out, millions of years, right? And I'm like, well, how do you know? Were you there with a the camera? I'm like, if I told you that I think this forms in a week, with a massive breaking of a dam, that the layers were formed in a week with an amazing flood that just kept dumping another layer of sediment, another layer of sediment, and all those sedimentary rock layers were formed in one week, and then in three hours, a dam broke, and all the water that was trapped behind the dam flew and broke through and created the canyon in four hours? What would you say? What would you think that a physicist from another college comes to RIT and says, I think the Grand Canyon could have been formed rarely rapidly, and uh, we're talking hours and days, not years. What would you say? What are you going to say? I'm Sarah Palin. I just believe dinosaurs and humans were around at the same time. And the kid said, yeah, I think you're Sarah Palin. I was even say athlete, right? And he didn't know that all those pictures of the Grand Canyon were showing up there were about St. Helens. You can't tell. They were all sedimentary rock layers. Sky high. It's a canyon. I got a video. Formed in four hours. Those layers formed in a week. From eruption after eruption after eruption. Coal is forming at the bottom of Spirit Lake as we speak, 30 years later. Coal, you know, coal went extinct, you know, like it's swamps from millions and millions of years ago. So I asked these people, coal is that old? Yes, coal is that old. And I said, well, how come carbon 14 is still in the coal? Do you know if this whole planet was made out of carbon 14? A million years later, there'd be no carbon-14 left. If we had started with the planet, I did the math, I didn't believe it, but I did the math. 
you start with the mass of the Earth as the original sample of carbon-14. And you let it decay with a half-life of 5,720 years. There won't be enough to detect after a million years. But every piece of coal that's in my driveway right now, that's supposedly 225 million years old, has enough carbon-14 in it to date it at about 10,000 years. Diamonds that formed in the core of the Earth 1.3 billion years ago have carbon-14. You date carbon-14 a diamond, it shows up at about 15, 20,000 years. Now, those dates aren't accurate either because I don't believe you can use radioactive dating to date a rock because of the assumption. So all those things like magnetic field, those mentions like that, you will discover their paradigm because they will put a belief system on you as if it was a fact. Well, you're not going to question that the magnetic field shifted every 18,000 years, are you? Yeah, because at Mount St. Helens, the domains are aligned this way, and then they're aligned this way, aligned this way, and it all did it in four hours. Yeah, I'm going to question it. Canyons, sedimentary rock form in different layers, and they get magnetized in different areas. You made an assumption that it was millions of years, so therefore you made an assumption that the magnetic field was flip-flopping every couple thousand, or every uh, 11 or 18,000 years, whatever it is. See, you'll reveal their paradigm. You'll reveal their belief system. You'll believe, you'll find their belief-saving device. Say that back to me, belief-saving device. Yes, device, for sure. <laughs> you'll remember it, you'll remember it. Okay, what was the other part of your question? Well, I'm sorry. going back to what you said, so you're just basing this just off of carbon-14 dating? Uh, carbon-14 is what we try to date uh, things that used to breathe. Things that inhale can be dated with carbon-14. The problem with carbon-14 is a really short <coughs> half-life. So you can only date things accurately to right. supposedly 100,000 years, and then there's not enough carbon-14 left to date. But from my understanding, carbon-14 is not the only thing that things are being dated with. Like, that's not the only method. Of right. So what a coincidence that when they use a dating method like the uranium lead method, where uranium's half-life is billions of years, that rock, dated with the uranium lead method, gets dated at 4 billion years. But the same rock using the argon, potassium argon method, which has a smaller half-life, same rock gets dated at not 4 billion years, but 1 billion years. Same rock. Is it 4 billion or 1 billion? Oh, I don't know. Try it with another method. Use the strontium method. Use another half-life of another material. So do I go? The same rock is 500,000 years old. And then you try it with carbon-14, that rock's 10,000 years old. But wouldn't you not be able to use carbon-14 because at a certain point you say you wouldn't be able to detect it, right? But it's still there, so what's that time? There should be no carbon-14 left in a piece of coal, if they're right. But there it is. So you know what they say? Contamination. There's not supposed to be any carbon-14 left in that coal. But it is. There's no way carbon-14 should be in a diamond. But it is. They're digging up mammoths in the, in the frozen tundra in the Arctic. A mammoth. Where the bottom of the math of mammoth has been dated at 30,000 years by carbon-14. And the top of the mammoth has been dated at 10,000 years. Say map. They're not teaching you this. They're not teaching that these aren't dating methods. These are comparisons between parent elements and daughter elements, and then you use your worldview to interpret dating from that. Radiocarbon doesn't date. All you do is measure how much carbon-14 there is, <coughs> how much carbon-12 there is, and then you make an assumption that the ratio now is the same as the ratio before. And if you believe your assumption, then you think you dated the rock, or you dated the bubble. It's all based on your worldview. It's not based on the evidence. The only evidence me and those guys agree on is how much carbon-14 there is now, and how much carbon-12 there is now. Everything else is worldview, and their worldview says, well, I know the Earth is old, so therefore. And I say, well, I don't know the Earth is old, so therefore. But if you're right, there should be no carbon-14 left in that piece of coal. And you can't find a piece of coal on this planet 
that doesn't have carbon-14 in it. But they don't tell you that if you use carbon-14 dating method for that coal, it comes out to be 10,000 years old. So they'll date it another method that gives them an answer that works with their worldview. We won't give up our belief system. But then again, neither am I. So they're thinking, I'm just as obnoxious. Oh, you think you're right. Yeah, you think you're right. <laughs> it's the battle of the world views. So what's your standard going to be? Naturalism or a biblical worldview? And if you pick naturalism, it absolutely falls apart. Because you can't justify even us talking about this without using a biblical worldview of a God that uses order and logic in order. We're having this wonderful discussion that's proving that the biblical worldview is a better worldview than the naturalistic worldview, because the naturalistic worldview can't explain us thinking and having morality and having logic. That's all borrowed from the biblical worldview. It's the funniest thing ever. So it's not about the evidence. I just wanted to share the evidence with you guys because I think once in a while you should arm yourself to the T. Do you remember what 1 Peter 3.15 said? That be ready to give an answer for your faith to anybody that sincerely asks. Some people are going to just try to tear you down and make you feel stupid. But there might be people that you meet that really would love to believe that there's a God who loves them so much that they were willing, that God was willing to actually become a ball of dirt with water attached to it, become one of us, and die in our place. That makes no sense. How can anybody love so much that you would give up deity? There's no way to even fathom that level of love. I mean, we're just beginning to grasp what he gave up. Everybody thinks, well, God. Christ died for our sins. I'm overwhelmed with what he left to do it. I can't imagine being one with the universe, one with the Father, in perfect harmony, absolute perfect love, perfect joy, content, happy with just the three of you, not needing anything to complete us, and then Pure insanity happens and the God of the universe decides to make us. And then knowing right from the start we were going to screw up and he should hit the delete button and just scrap the whole human idea and then instead says, oh, I love him though. I got to find another way. I got to find another way. I want them to be my kids. They're my kids. I can't leave them. They're going to die. They're going to drown. I can't leave them. I'll come down again. I'll you can't get here from here. Every religion on this planet teaches you how to get there through your own efforts. And there's this one that's not a religion that says, eh, you can't get there from here. I'll come down and get you. And I'll fix you the boot. I'll reformat your hard drive, give you a new operating system. It, that's just unbelievable. So when it comes down to the facts and the evidence, that's just fun for you to talk to friends about. Mm -hmm. If that's their struggle. I, I on the surface, you know, remember when you asked that question, or she might be gone by now. Remember that the question was asked, why were you an agnostic and how did you get to become a Christian again? On the surface, here's what I told them was the reason why I can't embrace Christianity. It's not good science. <laughs> the evidence is against it. The evidence doesn't support it. That's what I said on the surface. But I told her my honest truth and why, in my heart of hearts, I wasn't going to embrace Christianity and cramp my stuff. I wanted to be the Lord of my life. I wanted to be in charge. And there's no way I could be in charge and God could be in charge. So God's got to not exist. Because if he exists, I have to admit that I'm in rebellion. So he doesn't exist. See how it works? But on the surface, with all the arguments, with all the people, the evidence convinced me that God is a folklore. Science shows that evolution is true. Science shows is true. The Bible can't be true. And then I realized I wasn't doing any science. And then I realized the true good science was following the biblical uh, outline. That the biblical worldview followed good <coughs> science, right science. Observ observational science actually agreed with the Bible more than the naturalistic worldview. And then what was I going to do? I had my faith facade of why I didn't believe in God 
torn completely to shreds and had to look this God that I now knew that would existed right in the face and say, um, you're existing, you love me, you did so much for me and I'm in total rebellion, right? Yeah. I got nothing. I was screwed. <laughs> I couldn't get out of it. Yes? Helium is in the wrong place. You know what? Uh, do you remember learning about uranium decaying into lead and alpha particles get squirted out of the nucleus and uranium turns into uh, plutonium, loses two protons and two neutrons? That's an alpha particle, otherwise known as a helium nuclei, right? And then a bunch of beta particles get smacked out too, right? What's a beta particle? An electron. And then you go up in the periodic table. How freaky is that? That electron goes flying out of the nucleus and a neutron decays into a proton which stays in an electron that goes flying out, right? Meanwhile, you got a whole bunch of beta particles floating around. And then you got a bunch of helium nuclei floating around. Well, they love each other, so they become helium, a noble gas, nice and neutral, right? So we discovered helium on the sun before we discovered helium on the earth. Did you know that little trivia? We looked at the sun spectra. And we said, there's an element on the sun that we never knew existed before. It has these spectral lines. What do we call it? Helium. Helium. Sun. Sun element. Helium. Helium means sun. Right? Okay. Then we knew helium existed on the sun. And then, like 30 years later, they dug in these caves. And they were mining in these caves. And one kid looked at, one guy looked at the other and go, look at that rock. Whoa. <laughs> you know, and they were speaking with helium in their voice, and they're like, whoa, there's an element in here. They did the spectral analysis. Son of a gun, it's the same stuff on the sun. So, did you ever see a helium balloon last? Not the Marlar one. They, they give you a little more time. Did you ever see a regular rubber balloon filled with helium for a party? What does it look like the next day? On the floor. You know why? Helium is so tiny, it leaks out of the rubber molecules and escapes. Right? So, if you have a bunch of uranium that decayed into lead, <coughs> right, and the half-life is this much, how much helium would be left in the granite after four billion years? Not much. And instead, we find so much helium in these rocks that if we used helium to date the rocks, knowing the rate of escape, of helium through that much granite. And we played the tape back and said, with that same game they played, when did the helium get created in order for it to have this much still here? 45 meters. Well, we won't use that dating method, will we? Because we'll lose our grant. We'll lose our grant funds for that. So nobody knows about there's too much helium in the rocks. There's not supposed to be helium in the granite anymore. Should have leaked out by now. It's a small molecule that it makes its way out, and yet it's still there. That goes with another thing I'm working on, which is um, the one the polonium halos. Uranium decays into polonium, right? Here's the assumption that the dating people make, because they're so sure that their radioactive dating is infallible. This is what they do. They say all the lead that's in the sample used to be uranium. Can you follow this? It all used to be uranium in the beginning. So all they do now is look and see how much lead we got and how much uranium we still have. If you know the half-life, you can tell me how old the rock is. What's the assumption? What's the assumption that they have to assume is true in order to make that statement? This is how much lead we have. This is how much uranium we still have. We know the half-life, how old is the rock? What's the assumption? That all the lead used to be uranium. What if there was a lead created at the same time in the rock as the original uranium? Then your dating is going to make the rock look hugely old. I don't know if that's a word, but really, really old. Get it? Let's say there's a whole lot of lead in the rock and a little bit of uranium in the rock. You're going to date that rock as being super old. Well, what if the uranium and the lead both got showed up in the rock 7,000 years ago? But no, there's no such thing as God. 
So there's no such thing as a creation of a rock. It must have happened by natural processes. So therefore, all the lead must have came from uranium. What? Why do you have to assume the lead started off as uranium? So the polonium halos is beautiful. Remember when I told you about the alpha particle? It creates a shock wave in the granite. When it goes bang, turns into another element, it has a shock wave. It literally goes bang when it turns into a new element. And there's a shock wave that gets a, like a burned halo in the granite when these things all decay. And you get a ring, a halo. Well, they found polonium halos without the uranium halos. Which means the polonium, which is the daughter of uranium, that only has a half-life of four seconds, was there without the uranium to decay into it, which shows that the daughter elements are already there without the parent originally there, which means we have been making assumptions about radioactive dating that are not justified. We can't justify our assumptions. Now, you're not going to read this in your physics book. You're certainly not going to read it in your geology book, and you're probably not going to read it in your astronomy book. But the data is showing you cannot trust radioactive data. The professionals have been quoted as saying, we can't justify the assumptions anymore. But it's not showing up in your textbooks that you paid $248 for the other day. Yes, sir? We've got to close, but I want, yeah. to ask you, I want to ask you to do something for us. I want you to pray for the students. Oh, really? <laughs> have a boldness. You know, All right. We're equipping them. But I want you to pray that, that, that we can have a boldness to share. You just did it. Uh, I'll repeat what you just said. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing everybody here, and thank you for bringing everybody home safely. Lord, I ask you to let things that were said today, questions that were asked, get deep in our hearts where it becomes real, that we actually walk around believing that Scripture is true, and that your Holy Spirit actually inspired the Word of God right from Genesis 1-1 right to the end of Revelation. Lord, give us that boldness and that true faith that we're going to stand on your word and we're going to profess boldly the truth of the word. Give strength and give boldness, which is the only real gift of the Holy Spirit that anybody ever needs. They don't need to know facts and they don't need to know information. They just need to know that it's true. That saying in their heart of hearts, just like Thomas did, my Lord and my God. Lord, give everybody here the strength to profess your name in boldness to people that don't know you. Let them see every person they see as a drowning person who doesn't even know they're dying. <coughs> the, the boat here and the life preserver has been thrown and they have to take the opportunity when the door is still open. Lord Jesus, you are the door. And when that door closes, the time will be up. And I really believe in my heart the time is short. So, Lord, bless everyone here with that strength and that boldness to profess your name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to give you a I think other people are going to talk that are probably way more professional than I am. And don't say, but.